Um, I want to thank Dr. Keller for uh, inviting me to speak with you tonight. I understand that um, you have been meeting now, maybe this is the eighth session, is that right? Um, and so uh, I, I did tell Jeff, hey, um, you think I'm going to bore people be in the caboose of this? <laughs> and, and he very nicely said, no, I think you're the bow. So we'll, we'll see what happens uh, when, when you take the evaluation as to whether or not I was the caboose or the bow. Um, during this presentation, I have handed out to you in the gray folder a couple of items. One of them is a green form, okay? I would ask that you not fill the form out right now until the end of the presentation, and I'll tell you why. I don't know where you guys are on your estate planning journey for either yourselves or for your loved ones. Um, many people um, do not, they feel very intimidated by this whole process. Um, they think that, you know, maybe I'm not prepared. Uh, may, maybe, maybe I don't know how to go forward with respect to estate planning and taking care of these legal issues. Um, and so for those people who are kind of newbies in this process, I would ask that you wait until the next hour is over. Um, and then as a result of what we talk about, most probably there are certain concerns that are very, very apparent to you. Um, and so the, how I use these is that um, to the extent um, our future paths may cross, uh, to the extent uh, we talk about your estate planning for yourself or for your loved one, um, this is extremely helpful to me uh, because it allows me as an estate a planning attorney to facilitate the conversation and to make sure that we're really talking about what matters to you um, as opposed to things that um, are just not that important to you, okay? A little bit about me. I am a Baton Rougean, but I am a New Orleans native. Um, I grew up in Gretna, the West Bank of New Orleans, but my husband and I have lived here now for several years. Um, you need to know a couple things about me as an attorney. I practice law here in Baton Rouge for about 25 years now. Um, I am most probably the least litigious attorney that you will meet, okay? Um, I did that litigation thing before this, and uh, you know, life is just too short uh, for everybody beating up on each other and pushing paper. That's the way that I look at it, and from a planner's perspective, um, I truly believe that if you are educated and you are empowered um, with some information that you can take simple steps in order to ward off heartache and, and, and expense and whatever in the future, why don't you do it? Um, and I truly believe that um, the reason why is because people don't act, not because, well, some people do procrastinate, um, but I think a lot of people don't act because they just don't know and they just don't know how to get started, okay? The other thing you need to know about me is that I am a passionate planner. Uh, my husband calls me that, especially when he calls the calendar with um, our three boys, the air traffic controller program. <laughs> you know, everything needs to be planned um, because, again, if there is something that you can do very simply today in order to ward off that headache in the future, do it. Um, and so my passion is working with families, um, specifically in the estate planning, the legal area um, of estate planning. And as I mentioned to Jeff uh, about five or six years ago, I'm also a securities licensed. Come on in. Um, I'm, already, I'm also a securities licensed, so I was a financial advisor to families. Um, families is my passion, okay? Tonight, we will talk about how to avoid interdiction, probate, nursing home, uh, poverty and estate tax. Okay? First, I want to show you. Is it going to, uh oh, Jeff, hold on. I'm not, my oh. slide is not advancing. But that's just because I'm not pressing the button right now. It's probably. Right. Yeah, I want to tell you a little bit about my family. Um, just, uh, just so that we, we're talking about some pretty personal things. Um, so I figured they better know a little bit about me. Um, by the way, when you, when you combine, okay, perfect. When you combine that passionate planner um, with that least litigious attorney, you get me. And that is technically an estate planning and administration specialist. Do you know that this area of the law is a specialty area of the law? I like to compare it to the medical profession. You do not go to a general practitioner if you need an oncologist, okay? You don't. Um, the same thing applies in this area of the law. Uh, you cannot assume in your journey that all people, all attorneys, because they have the name attorney behind their name, the title, um, you cannot assume that everybody knows and is kept abreast of the, of the new trends in this area of the law. 
This attorney does not do criminal law, maritime law, bankruptcy law. There's a lot of things that if I'm ever approached, I know exactly um, you know, where my playground is. Um, and so I say that to you so that when you embark upon this journey, it's very important that you know that. And it's very important that you seek advice from somebody who's trained in this area. Um, so here's my family. You can tell I'm the minority. I'm the <laughs> only woman. We have three male animals, too. So um, I, I love it. Uh, they're the apples of my eye. Uh, my oldest son, Trey, he's a, a sophomore in college up in St. Louis, Missouri. Louis, who, by the way, was co-drum major of the Catholic High Band with Jeff's daughter. <laughs> like that. They're both graduating, um, and so he'll be off to college next year. And then, if you can believe it, I have a 12-year-old. And uh, he keeps us very busy. His name's Lane. Um, I love them dearly, and um, I've been told that there's a special place in heaven for a woman like me. So I'm hoping that they're not lying about that, okay? A little bit about our firm. Um, our firm, called the Rabelais Law Firm, actually we are a multi-state firm, but we just happen to be headquartered um, here in Baton Rouge. This is the facade of our office right there on Seagan Lane. Just for your information, we do have nine offices in the state of Louisiana um, and, uh, and, and, and states outside of Louisiana. All of our attorneys, all they do is one thing. They help people like you, perhaps who worry that you do not have a program in place to protect your loved ones and to protect your assets, your stuff. That's it in a nutshell, and that's all our attorneys do, okay? Now, here's what we're going to cover tonight. Um, we're going to talk about the mental capacity that is necessary in order to take action. You know, it's great to talk about all these great legal things and financial things and all this stuff, but guess what? It requires that you have the ability mentally to be able to do it. Um, so especially in this situation with patients who have been diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's, that doesn't necessarily mean that just because of a diagnosis they do not have mental or legal capacity. But the key is it's all in the timing. And so that's the reason why, especially if you're looking at folks um, in uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, within that spectrum, it's very important that you act as quickly as possible because we just don't know what the future holds. I'll talk to you about probate. Louisiana, you know, we call everything something different. We call it succession. What is this? Um, and what are the trends in estate planning many people are taking in order to avoid this process? Then I'll talk about that nursing home issue that we get so many questions about. I'll explain to you in layman's terms what a trust is. And we will talk tonight about two particular types of trust that may be very, very helpful to you, your family, um, and, and your loved ones. Then finally, there will be basically three different estate plans um, that you are free to choose um, for your family based on whatever your goals are of your family and we will talk about the benefits of them so you can kind of compare them apples to apples and very importantly included with that regardless of the plan that you ultimately choose for your family preparing for lifetime disability okay powers of attorneys and things we're not talking about you being dead now we're talking about you still being living but from a legal standpoint you're not in a position to be able to act um, uh, for yourself and then finally, we'll talk about how do you go from here? How do you, in fact, get started on some very, very simple steps um, that truly um, those people who do can get an estate plan in place for their family truly within a matter of weeks, okay? So let's get going. Legal or mental capacity. Now, first of all, let me say, I am a visual learner. So you see, I get into these PowerPoint slides, okay? But I will tell you that many people are not visual learners. Um, they're, they're audible, uh, you know, audio learners, I guess. And so I hope to be able to share with you true life stories um, of, of client experiences, many of which you will be able to relate to. And I have a feeling many of you could come on up here and you could talk to us about a couple of, a couple of stories too, okay? But in this case, I cannot emphasize more. Every time I give a seminar like this, I talk to clients. Capacity is always presumed. It's always presumed, okay? But you guys are in a journey right now, regardless if, if it's with respect to you and your diagnosis or a loved one, where you know what? That mental capacity, maybe not now, 
but sometimes sooner rather than later is in question. Okay, so it is critically important that you understand just in general what it is we're talking about for purposes of people being able to act for themselves. And this is the definition. You must be able to comprehend generally the nature and consequences of your actions. That is what mental or legal capacity means, okay? Illness, old age, delusion, sedation, it may not mean lack of capacity, but all of the facts will be considered. So you know how you love it when you ask a question and somebody says, well, it depends. <laughs> it depends. Everything is very, very fact um, sensitive. Um, and so in any event, I say this to you because what are we trying to, regardless of the facts, what we're trying to look through is whether or not the person is generally able to comprehend the consequences of what he does when he signs a will, when he gives away his house, when he transacts certain business. That's what we're looking at. And very importantly, you must know that a person with Alzheimer's disease or dementia may still have capacity, okay, if she comprehends the nature and the consequences of her actions. Okay, so for the most part, the rest of my presentation and talk with you tonight, it presumes mental capacity. Um, now, I guess this is the appropriate place to kind of throw this out there, um, and we're going to hit on it again, too. Do you realize that if you, during your lifetime, cannot make financial decisions or medical decisions for yourself, and you have appointed no one else to give them the legal authority to act upon you, have you ever heard of the word interdiction? Interdiction is another court process. Um, it's mean, it is emotional, it is very costly, whereby a court of law legally says, interdict, you are mentally incapable. You are not able to legally act for yourself, and then the court appoints a person, be it a spouse, be it a cousin, be it a neighbor, whatever, to serve as the agent. And so I think, um, you hate, I hate to use scare tactics, okay? But this is something that you definitely want to avoid. And that's the reason why it's important that people understand that if you don't take step, simple steps, powers of attorney, you may have heard of them, powers of attorney, doing it now while somebody has the mental capacity, it is absolutely huge, okay? Now, assuming mental capacity, now we're going to talk about probate. Um, Louisiana calls it succession. It is simply the court process that is required when I die and if I own things, stuff, in my name, in my name, I must go through the succession process. A court of law, a judge, must necessarily oversee the distribution of my assets. That's it simply, okay? When a person dies, regardless of whether or not a person has a will or doesn't have a will, when they die and stuff is in their name, it is required by Louisiana law and by the laws of most states that a court oversee the distribution of that property, okay? So I'm gonna share with you the story of my client, Ashley. I met Ashley about a year ago. This was soon after Ashley's dad had died. Now, before Ashley's dad died, he did it right. He went to an attorney, he had his will drawn up. The will named Ashley as the executor of the will. And then at the end of the day, the will gave everything that he owned to Ashley and brother, one half each, okay? What did he own prior to his death? A house, a car, a few bank accounts, and an investment account, okay? Upon his death, Ashley grabs that original will because she knows that she's the executor. She goes down to the funeral home in order to make arrangements for the burial of dad, at which time she learns that um, it's going to be about $13,000 as far as the expenses. Mm -hmm. Ashley didn't happen to have that available on her, so she takes that original will and she goes down to one of the banks that dad has a bank account. And she says, hey, I'm Ashley. I'd like to withdraw. $13,000 from my dad's bank account. The response, I'm sorry, Ashley, your dad's accounts have been frozen, okay? Well, time was of the essence. She had to certainly bury dad. So then she goes to the investment company and she asks the same question. 
I'd like to withdraw $13,000 from my dad's accounts. I'm sorry, Ashley. Your dad's accounts are frozen. You must go through probate to unfreeze them, okay? Bottom line, she wound up using three of her own personal credit cards in order to pay the $13,000 because she had a problem with access to money in this situation. Now we're at the funeral, and at the funeral, a family friend approaches Ashley and brother, always admiring the curbside appeal of the home, daddy's home. I'd love to buy it from you. Are you interested in selling? This was manna from heaven. Why? Because both Ashley and brother already had their own home. But they didn't need and their intention was to sell. So to have this so quickly thereafter to be able to, um, to sell this property was exactly what they were looking for. Um, two days after the funeral, Ashley calls the title company, the closing attorneys, in order to schedule the sale of the property to this gentleman at which time, the response is, I'm sorry, Ashley, you cannot pass clear title to property, transfer property, unless you go through probate, unless you go through succession. That's what Louisiana calls it. So Ashley had no clue where to turn. She didn't have to know any particular attorney who could help her with this. As a result of a friend of a friend of a friend, she ended up in my office. And I said, Ashley, this is exactly what I will do. I will represent you as the executor of your dad's estate. And I'm gonna hold your hand and walk you through the process. I'm saying this to you, many of you may have already personally experienced the succession process, but many of you have not. And I think just by hearing about the practicalities of it, it gets people thinking um, as to how might this pan out? How might, might this apply to our respective families? So I said, Ashley, the first thing we need to do is get you confirmed as the executor. You remember that will and the original will that named her as executor? Apparently it wasn't working, okay? They weren't listening to the original will. Why? Because the court process necessarily requires that a pleading be prepared by the attorneys. There's the salient information and facts about Ashley's dad. There are the appropriate signatures from the heirs. In this case, we were lucky because both Ashley and brother lived here in Baton Rouge. I will tell you this, um, I don't know what it is, but you know, everybody lives everywhere around this globe now. Uh, the, the idea of having everybody continue to live in the same city, it just doesn't happen as much. We're much more mobile. So something as simple as getting signatures of heirs sometimes takes a little bit longer than you would otherwise hope, okay? But we were very lucky in this case. And we prepared the initial pleading where we effectively open up dad's succession and we ask the court, hey court, would you please, please give Ashley the official document that she needs to be able to act on behalf of the succession. Just from a timing standpoint, by the time I met Ashley, by the time we prepared the documents, and by the time we officially filed the clerk of court here in East Baton Rouge Parish, it was about a month and a half after dad's death, okay? So what does it mean to file? Well, you open up like a lawsuit, okay? But it's called a probate matter or a succession matter. You file the initial pleading with the clerk of court. The clerk of court processes it. Um, I'm gonna simplify this because in the old day, there literally was a basket system. I don't think there's a basket system right now, but in my mind, I like the basket system. And after the clerk of court does his or her processing, it ultimately goes into the basket of the law clerk for the judge. Because of course, the law clerk for the judge needs to make sure he or she reads this make sure that from a legal standpoint, everything complies with the law. Then it goes from the law clerk's basket to the judge's basket. That's the big important basket. And then it just sits there until the judge is able to act. In this case, between the time of us opening the succession, filing with the clerk of court, and ultimately receiving back from the court the order that we ultimately requested, it was another month. Okay, so now we're about two and a half months after dad's death. And finally, there's a, a fancy legal name for this document that I'm holding right now, but for our purposes, this is Ashley's free ticket to ride. Okay, this is what the banks are going to listen to, hopefully. This is what the investment companies are going to, this is what officially gives Ashley the authority to act on behalf of the succession. So I said, Ashley, now you've been confirmed that as executor, now you need to go back to the banks and you need to go to the investment company. Remember all those frozen accounts? And what you must do, Ashley, is present this order to them 
and ask, would you please open estate accounts? What does that mean? That means that it is a succession account and a state account, and the overall plan is once these things are open, all of those frozen funds ultimately become unfrozen and deposited into the estate account. Now, you would think banks know how to open up accounts because they do it all the time. Very true. But what you also don't understand is that when this order is ultimately given to the banks, the institution's financial um, uh, attorneys and people need to look at it to make sure that this complies with the internal process. In this case, it was another month until the attorneys for the banks and the investment company made sure this was copacetic. So now we're about three and a half months after dad's death. In fact, the estate accounts were open. All of that frozen money became unfrozen and deposited into Ashley's um, estate account. Well, she's gone through the hoops. But guess what? She still needs court permission to act. After going through this, she still needs court permission to act. So she calls the guy, the family friend, who had expressed interest in buying the home. This was about three and a half, four months after dad's death now. Guess what? Ashley, I already bought a house. I did not have months to wait. I needed it then. Thanks for calling, but no thanks. By the way, if you're familiar with the Sherwood Forest subdivision, the house is for sale in the Sherwood Forest subdivision. If you're interested in a house in the Sherwood Forest subdivision, <laughs> please see me after this discussion because I might make a realtor commission on it too. <laughs> Bottom line is that we lost the sale because of this process is what it comes down to. Now, in addition, the executor is responsible for accountings. What does that mean? That means he or she is responsible to pull together all of the assets of dad and all of the debts that he had, and they have to be valued as of the date dad died. This is all pulled together in yet another round of legal pleadings, and this needs to make sure it includes the full description, it needs to include the value of the property, um, and very importantly, it goes through the basket process. Okay? Now, it has always gone through the basket process. And in this, if you really read into this, there's a lot of financial and confidential information. Bottom line, if you want to know how much your neighbor owns, you read this, you'll know exactly how much she's worth. Okay? There's a lot of private information. It has always been necessarily required in this process. But guess what has changed in the last three to five years? All of this is now available online. All of this is now available on the internet. So in the comfort of your own home or computer in your pajamas, unscrupulous people can check out what people ultimately inherit. So when I get in the field, surviving spouses contacting me saying stuff like, Laura, why are they calling to sell me this stuff? Laura, why are they asking for charitable donations to their organization? Why? Because they understand this now, okay? And I guess y'all, and you know, you talk about trends in this area, this right to privacy, okay, call it governmental intrusion, this is striking a chord with people and they are sick of it, okay? They're sick, sick of the cyber stalking, they're sick of the identity theft, and just by not necessarily publishing and putting into the court record for all to see this type of financial and sensitive information is something that people don't want to do if they don't have to do it, okay? In addition to this inventory of property, Ashley must also keep count of every expense that she spends on behalf of the succession. She gives all that information to us. We prepare yet another round of pleadings, goes through the basket process because the judge, in this case it's a him, the judge will not release the net proceeds, one half to each of the kids, until he is convinced that all estate expenses have been paid. Now, what are estate expenses? Um, attorney's fees, court costs, executor compensation, uh, appraisal fees, property taxes, the debts of the, 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 the decedent, like credit card bills, okay, other types of outstanding <coughs> obligations. Until the court is convinced that all of these things have been properly paid for and accounted for, it will only be then when the final document in a succession is called a judgment of possession. 
It officially terminates and ends the succession, and it officially puts people in possession. It gives it to them, just like the will said in this case, half to Ashley, half to brother. We, in this case, it's now been a year about since dad died. We are not at the judgment of possession yet. Why? Because we need to sell that house and we need to sell the car. And once we do get buyers for it, we're going to hopefully get a rubber stamp from our judge. We're going to pay all the costs of the respective sales. And net proceeds are going to go into the estate account. And then hopefully, sooner rather than later, everything will be divided one half between Ashley and brother. Okay? That is the succession process. So when I talk about this, I always get two questions. How long does it take? How much does it cost? How long does it take? Always months or years. I hope you understand why. In every round of these pleadings of a succession, there are inherent delays from heirs. You gotta find them. You gotta give them a sign. From attorneys. You have my favorite computer delays, clerk delays, judge delays, financial institution attorney's delays. And can't you see that if there are these inherent delays with each one of these rounds, and you're having, depending on the situation, five, maybe seven rounds of pleadings, very quickly it can mount up. Now what we're seeing in the field is, this takes a long time, this causes stress to families. Everybody starts getting at each other, okay? And so what we're finding is that just this process it often cripples the family relationships of those that you leave behind, okay? How much does it cost? Do you know there's no set standard for succession costs in the state of Louisiana? Um, and so I'll share with you another client. Um, this lady's husband died about four or five years ago. She's a parishioner of a downtown Baton Rouge church. Um, her husband died. She wanted to sell the house because she wanted to move out of state near a grandchild. Uh, guess what? She had to go through succession, right? So she needed to go through succession, and she needed an attorney, and she didn't know an attorney. But then she remembered that there was a new parishioner, a young guy, who was an attorney, right? And asked if he would mind doing her succession. Very importantly, y'all, no costs were ever discussed. So another word to the wise, another hint in this process. You must demand transparency in this process, and I'll tell you why. Because 10 months went by, and sure enough, the succession was proceeding. The sale for the actual home was set. Lady was packing up her stuff. Um, and before she moved out of state, she goes to the mailbox. She gets a letter from the guy with a $35,000 succession bill. Okay? Egregious? Angering? Yes. I can honestly say it's not the norm. But you know what? It doesn't have to be the norm. When you hear stuff like this happen, even on a limited basis, it's enough to have the hair stand up on the back of your neck. So what I am saying to you, please, in this process, you must. A good estate planning attorney in this area, we know, okay? Transparency must be demanded, and you have a right to know this. So in Louisiana, uh, I see successions running anywhere from 4500 7500 $10,000, 20000 on up. Y'all, every succession is different. We have a different <coughs> cast of characters. Some of the characters get along, some don't, especially when they have in-laws involved, okay? You have a lot of different competing interests. Um, also, the property that the person dies possessed of is a big deal. If I die and I have a continuing closely held business, the only way I'm going to reap value is if I figure out how to continue to run the business as opposed to just cash accounts where you can just order wire transfers. So a lot of it depends on the cast of characters, but for your purpose, anywhere from $4,500, $5,000, $7,500, $15,000 on up. And by the way, if you are a married couple, double that because there's no such thing as married couple successions here in Louisiana. Every person goes through his or her own succession. So as you can see, it doubles the cost, it doubles the delay, and it is certainly doubling the stress that these uh, families are going through, okay? Now, we're gonna shift gears very quickly, and I am going to introduce to you this nursing home question that we get so many questions about. Listen, 
No one plans to go into a nursing home. No one has ever come into my office, and that's part of the estate plan, okay? But the fact of the matter is, they're all crowded. The fact of the matter is, we're living longer, medical technology is improving, and we must be educated on what the situation is first, and then if we want to attack it in any way, how do we approach it, okay? Basically, you move into a nursing home. By the way, we're talking about skilled nursing home. I'm not talking about assisted living. I'm not talking about return to retirement communities. I'm talking about skilled nursing facilities. Each one of us, even though we don't want to think about it, each one of us needs to face the fact that we may need skilled nursing at some time in our future, okay? You walk into a nursing home, and basically, you pay your rent to live there, just like an apartment. The rent in, Louis, in the Baton Rouge area, anywhere from five to $7,000 per month. Obviously, if a couple moves into the nursing home, you double that. But for purpose of just throwing it out there, we're looking at, at about five to $7,000 per month. You basically spend down your private assets until you get below a certain amount. If you're a single person, it's less than $2,000, at which time you will qualify for Medicaid, not Medicare, Medicaid benefits for purposes of your nursing home stay, okay? Assuming that you continue to live in a nursing home for a period of time receiving those Medicaid benefits, what happens is, is that upon your death, Medicaid has the right, the Department of Health and Hospitals has the right to be able to make your heirs. They're not kicking anybody out of the house. Let me make sure I'm very, very clear with that. But upon the death of both spouses, the DHH Medicaid has the right to be able to force the sale of the home in order to take the sales proceeds and reimburse Medicaid for whatever money Medicaid has expended on behalf of your loved one, okay? Now, this is called Medicaid estate recovery, and it's real. It never used to be real, and I'll tell you why. I've been going to continuing legal educations in this area now for 25 years, and every year you get the pit in your stomach when they talk about the lean and the big bat, and they scare the heck out of people. Guess what? Louisiana never ever enforced each right to be able to liquidate the family home, the sacred cow, so to speak, in order to reimburse Medicaid. But guess what else has changed in the last three to six years? They're enforcing it now. Why do you think that is? Because Louisiana wants to continue to receive its federal funding for roads, bridges, infrastructure, and the like. And Uncle Sam is saying, Louisiana, you got to ante up if you want to continue to receive the federal funds. And one of the many ways that Louisiana is anteing up is they're finally enforcing this lien that they've had all along, but they just haven't enforced until recently, okay? People need to know this so that then you have a plan of action um, that, that, you can, that you can take steps toward achieving. Um, I have a client named Jan. Jan lost her mother two months ago. Mom had lived in a nursing home for quite a while. Um, upon mom's death, Jan gets a letter from the local Medicaid office saying that Jan needs to sell a house because the first $162,500 from, from the sale of a house needs to go back to, reinf uh, to, to reimburse Medicaid, okay? So I have another house to sell right now because that's exactly the process that we're going on in order to be able to do it. So, so the reason why I say this, and if people have heard of the words spend down, nursing home poverty, um, what does that mean? That means that people, because of the fact that we're living longer, okay, and we're needing the skilled nursing care, maybe, maybe, everybody's got crystal balls, but they're not telling us anything. We don't know, we don't know. But what's happening is that people are spending down their life savings in order to pay their rent, and then when they get it, they should stay in the nursing home long enough, they get to a point where if they continue to receive Medicaid benefits, now, even the family home, the sacred asset, so to speak, in many, in many families, is now being required to be sold, and at the end of the day, your heirs get nothing. Okay? Depends on how you look at it, I guess. Okay, now we're going to switch gears again. Oh, by the way, in a bit, I am going to talk to you about a way that you can protect your life savings and your home 
from this nursing home poverty issue. Okay, but first, I want to introduce to you what is a trust. Okay? It used to be that only wealthy people had trust. That's just not the case anymore. And I would ask that regardless of what uh, knowledge you have about trust, I would ask that for the next 15, 20 minutes, you forget about it. Why? Because what people, for the most part, do not understand is that there are lots of different types of trust. They are established in order to accomplish lots of different goals. And so to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples, you're talking to somebody at a cocktail party about their trust, and you're talking and you're hearing about limitations or you're hearing about, guess what? It all depends on what goal they're trying to accomplish. I could rattle off 15 different types of trust right now. Each one of them is set up in order to be able to accomplish a different thing. So I say that the two trusts that we're going to talk about are trying to accomplish two different things. Okay? Now, for those of you who have been reading The Advocate, Tom Benson, Tom Benson's got a lot of trust. Okay? And I can assure you that many of Tom Benson's trusts have to do with taxes. Okay? And there are just a lot of different things. And he's got a lot, a lot of money to set trust up with. But in any event, um, but I don't know why Tom Benson has created these trusts. Only he knows. Okay, so that's the presumption. You cannot automatically assume. Okay, I'm going to introduce to you the story of my clients, John and Jane Doe. Now, of course, that's not their real name, but I'm trying to protect their identity. Um, I met John and Jane about six years ago. Um, when John and Jane came into my office, I asked them the same questions that I would ask you or any family in an initial meeting. And guess what? It's not rocket science. What is important to you? What do you hope to accomplish? Are there any special concerns that you have that we need to know about in order to be able to plan around? Some people come into my office and say, Lauren, I don't know what I need to do. I just know I need to do something. Okay? Some people come in, they have very, very specific requests, special needs children. Um, another one, another great one these days, protecting your children from their future divorces. Okay? There are a lot of different things. Many people, and that's the reason for the green form, many people come into my office not having a clue, and I facilitate them in order to kind of retrieve it. You don't have to have a financial statement, a balance sheet, and copies of everything in order to come talk to somebody about your estate plan. Because at the end of the day, it's about your family, and it's about what you're trying to protect in the way of family and your assets. Well, when I asked these questions of John and Jane, Jane was adamant. Laura, I want to avoid the Louisiana succession at all cost. Now, the reason why she said that is five years before her coming into my office, her mother died, and her mother had named uh, Jane as the executor of her estate. It was five years after mom died. All six of her siblings hated each other. The entire estate had been spent in litigation fighting against each other. The in-laws got involved, okay? She says, Laura, my mother always prided the fact that us seven got along very well. She is rolling over in her grave right now, and I'm at a point in time where I am fit to be tied. If I die and I leave my husband with something like this, I would never, ever dream of doing it. And very importantly, upon the death of both of us, we would never want to bless our children with this type of mess, okay? She's pretty adamant. So she says, I want to know how can I give my stuff away to my kids in the way that I want it, but I don't have to go through that process. And I said, John and Jane, and this is the first type of trust that we're going to talk about this evening. It is called a revocable living trust. Okay, y'all, it is a will replacement. It is a will replacement. We all know what wills are. This is a will replacement. It does the same thing that a will does in your mind, but you do it in a way where you do not have to go through the probate process. Why? And this is the legal theory behind it, in a nutshell. Remember I told you that when you died and things were in your name, you had to go through the court process because the law requires that a judge oversee the distribution of your stuff. But guess what? When you die, and if things are not in your name, but they're in the name of your trust in which you maintain full control, they're not in your name anymore. 
And since they're not in your name anymore, you don't have to go through the succession process. Rather, we look at the trust <coughs> instrument, the will replacement, in order to figure out who's in charge, who gets what, and when they can get it. Okay? That's the magic of it. It is all in a name. It is all in a name. So, they wanted to simplify a state settlement. They wanted to avoid probate costs, delays, and stress. We set this up. John and Jane, this is how this works. John and Jane, they set up the trust. They are the co-trustees of the trust. They are fully in charge of the trust for the rest of their lives. So when we talk about wills, we talk about executors. When we talk about trust, we talk about trustees. It's just nomenclature, okay, but for your purposes. John and Jane maintain full control. When the first spouse dies, the second spouse maintains full control. Only upon the death of the second spouse, in this case, they named their daughter Linda. Linda's a CPA. She was the person who was responsible to pull everything together and ultimately divide everything three ways among Linda and her two brothers, okay? John and Jane, very important in this trust, y'all. They stay in complete control. There are other trusts that you do not stay in complete control. This one is not one of them. So, you ask, well, Laura, that sounds very complicated. How can you put stuff in the name of the trust? Well, for example, the home and any other real estate that they own as part of a special legal service that an estate planning attorney provides in this estate plan, all of the transfers of your home and your real estate they're all prepared and they're actually recorded in the public records in the parish where the, where the property exists. So for example, there's an act of transfer. John and Jane transfer to John and Jane as co-trustees of the John and Jane Revocable Living Trust, the house. That's it. It's recorded in the conveyance records of East Baton Rouge Parish. It is not in their name anymore. It's in the name of the trust. <laughs> Non-retirement investment accounts. Guy came in a couple of months ago. Let's call him John Smith. He went through a hellacious battle with the succession with respect to his wife who had died several years prior. Um, and he had one remaining son in his mid-50s, not a very strong business acumen, kind of a nervous fellow. And he said, Laura, I can tell you, having to deal with you attorneys and a judge upon my death, this, this would make him die. There's no way my son can handle this. I heard that there is a way that I can still get all my stuff, if you will, to my son, but I do it without having to go through that process. Said, you came to the right place. So we set up the John Smith Revocable Living Trust. Very importantly, Mr. Smith set it up. He had a $900,000 Edward Jones investment account, okay? He set the trust up, he's the trustee. When we set the trust up that day, before he left the office, I called Edward Jones. Hey, Edward Jones, it's Laura Poche. I'm here with your favorite client. Uh, he just now created his own trust. Can you send us the form, Edward Jones, in order to change the name of his investment account from John Smith to John Smith as trustee of the John Smith Trust? No problem, Laura. One page form, takes two minutes to fill out. Done. When we send the form back to Edward Jones, we attach a copy of the trust. Why would you think that would be? Well, guess who is appointed the successor trustee? Guess who is in charge when Mr. John Smith dies? His son. It's technically called a successor trustee. He sets this trust up. He renames the investment account into the name of the trust. He lives hopefully a long life. Upon his death, all the son needs to do is call Edward Jones. They're expecting his call because they have a copy in their vault, okay, which says that it is John Smith's son who is going to be in charge when John Smith dies. All he needs to do, the son, present identification. They need to know he's John Smith's son. And when he does that, Edward Jones will take immediate direction from the son, regardless of whether or not he wants to hold, reinvest, whatever, immediately, all outside all outside of this probate process. You may own certificates of deposit, mineral interest. These are what they call probate assets. Why? Because if you die and these things are in your name, you must go through probate. So if you put these things in a trust upon your death, they will not go through probate. You will look at the corners of the trust document, a will replacement, in order to figure out where they go. Now, there are a lot of other assets that you own 
um, designated beneficiary accounts, 401ks, IRAs, life insurance annuities. Well, as you can imagine, these little suckers, they already avoid probate by their very nature. If you are a principal beneficiary or rather a, um, a designated beneficiary on these types of accounts, upon the death, it goes immediately outside of probate. Okay, so you don't have to worry about changing any of them. And I'm very happy to say that if you have uh, checking accounts, savings accounts, or vehicles, it is not necessary to change the names of those things into um, the trust. Uh, have you ever heard of the expression that there are several ways to skin a cat? Well, there are several ways to avoid the probate process. And when it comes to checking accounts and savings accounts, this is what it is. If you are a married couple, you must add a third person, that's not the husband or the wife, a third distinguishable person as an added signer to every one of your checking and savings accounts. And if you are a single person, you just need to add one other person. So let me make sure I'm clear. I don't care if the accounts or in your name, his name, my private little fund money savings account, and not my husband's, doesn't make a difference. What these financial institutions are doing now is upon the death of either spouse, regardless of the title on those accounts, they're automatically freezing 100% in those accounts. Why, Laura, that doesn't sound fair. Upon the death of my husband, I want to be able to go there. I own half of that account. You absolutely do, but guess what? You're not getting it until you go through probate. That's what we're trying to avoid. We need access to cash. So by adding a third different person as an added signer to every one of your bank accounts, upon the death of one, the instructions to that person is to go down to Capital One and withdraw 100% of everything and give it to the survivor. Now, this has to be a person that you trust. Because the fact of the matter is that you wipe you out, okay? <laughs> Most people have a person or persons that fit this bill. If you do not, then okay, we just simply change the name of these accounts into the name of the trust. This is just a different way of getting access. Y'all, if Ashley's dad had simply added Ashley as an added signer to those accounts, she would have gone down to the bank, she would have been able to access every bit of cash, okay? Regardless of whether or not you ultimately take any future steps in, a, in, a, in an estate plan, everybody can do this tomorrow. You add an added signer. And vehicles. In association with this setup, one of the things that um, we also do is take advantage of the Louisiana law, which is a good thing. In the day, I had to open successions to transfer cars. Total waste of time and effort. Total waste and money. Now, Louisiana legislature caught a clue. And now, in association, even with the revocable living trust set up, a will replacement plan, you still have what they call a poor, poor, poor over will. I call it like a little baby will. It's never, ever meant to be probated because we're trying to avoid probate. It's done for two reasons. How do you get your personal effects, your pretty stuff, to the people that you want it to go to? And cars. So what happens in my setup is I die, my husband takes my little baby Will, and my death certificate, and goes directly to the Department of Motor Vehicle and transfers the title of the, 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 um, the vehicles instantly, all outside of the probate process. Okay? Now, I want to quickly tell you the rest of the story with John and Jane, so you see how this works in life. Get a call three years ago from Jane. John died. Oh, Ms. Jane, I'm very, very sorry. Is there anything that I can help you with? Laura, I am distraught. I am fit to be tied. I was talking to my neighbor at the mailbox yesterday. She knows, by the way, it was October of a particular year. Um, I want to sell my house because I want to move out of town. I want to live in an assisted living near daughter Linda, remember the CPA daughter. I'm at the mailbox talking to the neighbor, and the neighbor says, there is no way you're going to get to Linda by Christmas. You need to go through probate, and that could take a long time. So she, of course, worries, worries, worries sick about it. And I said, Miss Jane, do you remember what you and Mr. John did three years ago? Do you remember you came into my office and said, I want to avoid probate at all costs? And we set this trust up. And you remember you and Mr. John were the trustees? And upon Mr. John's death, guess who the boss of the trust is? You, Miss Jane. 
hang up the phone, call the guy who wants to buy the house, set up the sale. Two weeks later, done. She had immediate authority to be able to sell the house and not have to wait through, nor pay for, nor get stressed with the probate process. Okay? Jane could sell the home right away. She could access the investment accounts. Probate number one for John avoided. Very simple for the surviving spouse. Very simple for the surviving spouse. Three months ago, I got a call from Linda. Mom died. Jane died. Very sorry to hear that, Linda. Is there anything I can help you with? She said, Laura, my mom has been dead for three months now. And every day, at least once a day, I get a pestering phone call from one of my brothers demanding his one-third share in mom and dad's one and a half million dollar investment account. I am mourning. This is not the time to be talking to me. He is not respecting me. Well, you, know, you can imagine. She was very, very upset and very, very angry. And I said, Linda, do you remember what mom and dad did? They gave you the best gift they could possibly give you. Now that mom is deceased, who is the successor trustee? Who is the new judge of the trust? You, Linda, hang up the phone, call the investment company, introduce yourself, show proof of identification because they're expecting your call. They have a copy of the trust, remember? Three days later, done, done. Three wire transfers, $500,000 to each of the kids, done all outside of the probate process. So in this case, Linda was immediately in charge. She could manage everything. She distributed everything quickly to the three children. Now, two things about this trust. This is a tax-neutral trust. What does this mean? This trust is not helping you for tax purposes. This trust is not hurting you for tax purposes. This trust doesn't even require its own tax ID number. Everything continues to flow through the Social Security number just like it always did. Okay? This is a tax neutral trust. If you pay property tax and capital gains tax and income tax before you set up the trust, you're going to pay the exact same thing after you set this trust up. Okay? And very importantly, guess what? You avoided the probate process. So you remember the detailed descriptive list of assets and debts? all the financial and confidential information that necessarily had to be put online for all to see as part of the succession process, guess what? You don't go through the succession process. You don't have to put this in the public record. Nobody is going to be able to see what you have. It all stays, I call it, within the circle of trust. All the people who are in charge of the trust and ultimately the beneficiaries of the trust. It is because, I believe, in my opinion, because of this right to privacy issue, this is the reason why truly this setup of an estate plan is the most popular way to set up your estate. Of course, it all requires legal capacity, right? But now you have an idea of what you can do in order to do certain things. Talk about a way that you could protect your home and your life savings from nursing home poverty. But first, I'm going to give you a very quick lay of the land of Louisiana long-term care Medicaid law. Up on the left is the resource test. So you walk into a nursing home. They take a snapshot of what you own. You can own a home, but don't forget, remember that at the end of the rainbow, there's that potential estate recovery after both spouses are deceased. They can, they can force the liquidation. But you can own a home, a car, a prepaid funeral, and term life insurance that has no cash surrender value. Okay? If you own anything in the bottom left quadrant, the way that Medicaid looks at it is you own it, you spend it on your own nursing home rent. That's it in a nutshell. You own it, you spend it on your own nursing home. Up on the right is how much you can have and qualify for Medicaid. If you're an individual person, $2,000. If you're a married person and both spouses go into the nursing home, $3,000. And if you're married, this is a very common situation, you're married and only one person goes into the nursing home and the other one stays at home. And I'd like to share a story on this so people understand what this means. So I did a succession for a gentleman about eight years ago. Um, his surviving spouse is a very, very dear lady. She's in her late 70s. Got a phone call from her about a year ago. 
Lauren, guess what? I get married. Like, oh my gosh, Miss Such and Such, that's awesome. Tell me about it. Well, I met this guy. We're at a dance club together. We do this professional dance circuit. We love to travel with each other. He proposed marriage last week, and I accepted. And I said, well, this is awesome, but why are you calling me? She goes, because a little birdie on my shoulder said, maybe you ought to run this by Miss Poche. So I said, look, you can talk more than I can talk. Can you give me an idea of what you're concerned about? She goes, yes. I don't know exactly how much my fiance has. I think it's about $40,000. I want to know, by the way, when the husband died eight years prior, he left about $750,000 in investments. She hasn't touched it for eight years because she was living on her Social Security, her pension. It's just, now it's 900000 okay? That's important fact. I want to know if we get married and if he goes to the nursing home, Will he spend his $40,000? I say, if you get married, he goes into the nursing home. Not only will he spend his $40,000, you will spend down your $900,000 until you have $119,220. That's what that number means. Silence. Indiscernible mumbling, y'all. The only discernible <laughs> phrase, shacking up. That is exactly what she did. She called off the way. She could not take the risk. So the lesson to be learned, Medicaid does not care about prenuptial agreements, separate property agreements, your accounts in one name. If you are married and there is the letter M in the Medicaid computer behind your name, they're going to look at the assets of both spouses. Very important to know this. So Nelda came into my office about five years ago. And Nelda, this is Nelda, y'all. This woman has an unbelievable work ethic. She's now in her mid-70s. Um, she's always worked two and three jobs. Um, at a very young age, she lost her husband, raised three little ones. They're all now in their mid-40s. And um, she, because of working very hard, has had a life savings of about $450,000 in her home. Her mantra in life is that upon her death, she wants her children to receive one-third, one-third, one-third. They're not particularly well off. Um, this would go a long way. And this truly is what drives Nelda. Why is Nelda concerned? Because she has a couple of friends um, at the health club that she went to um, that had to go into a nursing home. And she saw firsthand how the kids had to spend down the assets of these individuals. And then in one case, there was actually the sale, the enforcement of that lien. And now she just started, she couldn't sleep at night. She says, Laura, my life's mission um, is to do this for my children. Now these are her words, y'all, not mine. If I had to go into a nursing home, and if I had to ultimately spend it all, and I ultimately lost the house because of this situation, I would feel as if my life was not. Pretty serious stuff. Now look, that's Nelda. I have clients on the total opposite side of that spectrum, whose goal in life is to spend their last nickel on the day they die. Because the way that they look at it is, I've worked very hard, I've educated those kids, I've set them on an independent path. I totally get it. It was probably everybody in here somewhere on that spectrum, right? It wasn't now. And you got to take your client as you find your client. I want to know how can it be that I can protect my life savings and my home, and in the event someday in the future I need to go into the nursing home, I will not have to spend down my own money for my nursing home rent. That's it. Now the the solution is the second type of trust that we're going to talk about. It's called a Medicaid irrevocable trust. And I want to talk to you about the word irrevocable. People are haunted by that word. Ooh, that means I can't change it. Not true. There's one thing in this trust that you cannot change. But this is the one thing that makes the property in this trust not Nelda's for purposes of eligibility and being able to qualify for Medicaid benefits immediately for the nursing home without having to spend down your assets. And this is what it is. You create this trust just like we created the other trust. Certain property is put into this trust. Nelda is the trustee of the trust. She calls all the shots. She lives off of the income. She's the one that makes all the decisions. If, if at any point in time in the future, she needs to get into some of the assets that she's trying to protect because she needs it for a new car or whatever. She can have it for any reason whatsoever. But guess what? 
guess what she's not allowed to do? She is not allowed to grab into that trust and directly put the money in her pocket. Because if she does, and Medicaid finds out, what will Medicaid say? You have unfettered access to this trust. You have it, you spend it on your own nursing home. So she can't do it directly. Well, the opposite of directly is indirectly. So guess what? How this truly works, if at any point in time she wants $30,000 for a Toyota Camry, she can. She just transfers out paper trail, paper trail out to any one of her three kids, the $30,000, and the next day they give it right back to her. Sounds like a farce, huh? It's not a farce. It is taking advantage of the Medicaid provisions. Now, to get the biggest bang for the buck, and I realize we all have crystal balls, but they're not telling us anything, you have to set this thing up at least five years before you want Medicaid to kick in and before you apply for Medicaid benefits. So truly what people do, they set this trust up, they get the assets, particularly the family home and some of the big investment accounts, if they have investment accounts, they get in that trust day one because they're starting the five year clock ticking. And the hope is that by the time we get down to five years and one day, they walk into that nursing home, they apply for Medicaid, they will immediately qualify for Medicaid, and they will not have to spend any of the assets down that they have protected in this trust. So Nelda asked the question, Laura, what happens if I can't hold out for five years? What happens if I need to go into the nursing home for one year, I mean, for after four years? I'm like, well, here's how it works. You set this trust up, you start the five-year clock ticking. You go through four years. You move into the nursing home as a private pay patient for one year. Four plus one is five. One day after the fifth anniversary, you apply for Medicaid and you will immediately qualify. And from then on, you will not spend a penny of the assets that are in that trust on your nursing home. Okay? Now, think about what has happened in the grand scheme of things. She started with $450,000 cash. She spent down $70,000 that year on nursing home. Four fifty dollars less seventy. dollars she still has $380,000 that she's protecting and the home because this is set up so that there's no way they can force the liquidation and the sale of the home after she dies, okay? This was the solution for Nelda. Nursing home has got to be likely in more than five years. If you are an extremely wealthy person, chances are this is not for you. And the reason why is because you do have the financial wherewithal to be able to pay for assisted living, retirement community, nursing home, in-home private care, okay? Um, and if the bulk of your estate is in a large IRA, a pre-tax, pre-tax vehicle, we cannot immediately transfer one of these suckers into a trust. Otherwise, there will be major penalties there will be major capital gains tax implications, and you're not going to go in there, okay? So that's the setup. That is called the Medicaid Irrevocable Trust. So you know the name of this game, what's the question? Do we put the house in the kids' names or not? On the left are all the reasons why you do not put things in your kids' names. Effectively, you lose control. On the right are all the reasons why you would want to transfer these things to your Medicaid trust. You continue to maintain lifetime control, and should you at any point in the future ever need Medicaid benefits for a nursing home, if it ever gets to that, you set this thing up in the right way so you walk in day one and you pay zero down of those assets on your nursing home. Okay? Now, I told you in summing up that we're going to talk about the three different estate plans that we've talked about tonight. Now, I know for a fact we didn't officially talk about a will plan, but I think everybody knows what a will is. We talked about the revocable living trust plan. That's the one that John and Jane Doe did, okay, to avoid probate. And then we just now talked about Nelda's Medicaid irrevocable trust plan in order to make herself eligible uh, for Medicaid benefits for the nursing home. Now, this is important. Regardless of which plan you ultimately choose for your family, everyone, look at the bottom, they all must necessarily include powers of attorney, health care powers of attorney, and a living will declaration. 
So, go on to that capacity issue again. If you cannot get and make financial or healthcare decisions for yourself, someone must be appointed to be able to do it. Because if you do not give that authority to somebody and you lose it, and they need it in order for you to transact business, the only way that a spouse, for example, or someone else can get it is to sue you in court in the interdiction process. <laughs> and if you thought probate was emotional and expensive, it doesn't shake a stick at interdiction. And if I told you that by simply getting powers of attorney for financial purposes and for medical health care purposes, you would do it. That is the easy solution to be able to nip that in the bud. All of your, all of your um, <coughs> loved ones that have this diagnosis of dementia, do it now. Do it now. Just because you have a diagnosis of dementia does not mean you do not have the mental and legal capacity to execute these documents. But you know what? We don't know what the future is going to hold. So do it now. And very importantly, we discuss life support systems questions with all of our clients. And regardless of your personal preference with respect to life support systems, we paper it the way you want it papered. So what happens is exactly what you want to have happen in that event. Okay? So it's so critically important. I know we talk about all these fancy estate plans and death. I would suggest to you that because, do you know that the, that the probability of you dying is less than you becoming disabled? Do you know that? And if you knew that, this is a no-brainer to get these powers of attorneys done immediately. Now, of course, you should do the trust or the wills as well, but this is critical. So now, let's go back and we'll look at each of these plans quickly. So the will plan, you know what this is. It's easy to establish. You can change it at any time. Does it avoid probate? If there's one thing that you leave here tonight with, no, it does not. If you have a will or even if you die without a will, as long as stuff is in your name when you die, you will go through probate. And each probate costs, of course, I'm throwing a number out there, because it all depends on the succession, 5,000 to 50,000, it takes six months to two years. You multiply that times two if you are a married couple. And does it protect you from nursing home spending? No, because you have unfettered access to everything. Then, now look, I'll tell you this because I can. Lawyers want you to do your will right. Because the fact of the matter is, law firms profit tremendously by taking your estate through probate. I said it. It's true. It's true. So that's the reason why it's a mission of mine to educate people that you do have options. Okay, you do have options. Now, I'm off my soapbox. Go to the revocable living trust plan. It's easy to establish. What does that word funding mean? You gotta get the stuff into the name of the trust. Because if you do not rename the accounts that need to be renamed and you die, guess what? You may have trust, but the stuff is still in your name. And you still got to go through probate, which would irritate me. So it's critically important, it's critically important that it be done right and that it fully be funded. You can change it at any time. Does it avoid probate? That's music to my ears. Yes. And does it protect you from nursing home spending? No, because you have unfettered access. And then finally, the nail the plan, the Medicaid Irrevocable Trust. It's easy to establish, but you have to fund it. Now, can you change it at any time? You know, I'm a lawyer, and lawyers always have to be very, very careful. I err on the side of caution. You can change a lot of stuff about this trust, but the one thing that you cannot change is the right to be able to grab into that trust and pull it out and directly put it in your, pro in your pocket. Because if you do that, you have basically shot yourself in the foot, and all of the assets that you thought you were protecting now are eligible for spend down for the nursing home should you go there at some time in the future. Guess what? It also avoids probate. Why? It is a trust. It's a trust. So I call this third setup, this is the double whammy plan. Because not only does it avoid probate, but at least it starts the five year clock ticking to try to make you eligible for this type of Medicaid benefits if at some point in the future um, you need them for your nursing home. Okay? Lots of people say, Laura, if I want to do Medicaid planning, but if I also want to avoid probate, do I need both of those trusts? No. 
you just go with the one trust on the far right because it does two things, okay? And then really finally, how do you go from here? You know, you've learned a lot. I know that this may be very overwhelming because we talked a lot about a lot of different things. It all starts, y'all, with an initial visit to an estate planning attorney. Um, and it's at that visit, it takes about an hour and a half, maybe two hours, it gets personal. It needs to be personal. This is your family that we're dealing with. All you need to know is what's important to you, what do you hope to accomplish, what are the special concerns that you have that we need to plan for, okay? Now is the time, in two minutes, that you should fill out the green form with the top three concerns that you have at this time as a result of hearing all this stuff, okay? And my hope is, is that you give me the green forms before you leave. I will give you a copy of my special legal report, which for you visual learners, does a lot in writing of everything I just now talked about, okay? Um, and then if our future paths should cross, by the way, this is a complimentary basis. It's a total complimentary basis. You bring the decision makers. Very important, y'all. Do you realize that when you go into an attorney's office, if you don't have all the decision makers, you're wasting my time and you're wasting your time? So who is an, an important decision maker? It's the person when I ask a question, are you ready to make a decision? They say, oh, I need to talk to such and such first. That's an important decision maker. Those are the people that need to be at this meeting and those are the people that we talk about these things and we talk about your concerns and as a result of talking, hey, maybe this is the suggested way that you should go about leaving things and taking care of your loved ones, okay? Um, and then you say, okay, um, we made these family decisions, I gather the necessary information, you prepare the legal documents, regardless of whether or not it's the will plan, it is the uh, trust plan, all the power of attorney documents and the living will declaration, all of that needs to be customized. And then in a matter of you know six, seven weeks, you literally are coming back from that initial meeting in order to put everything in place. But very importantly, first of all, you got to act. We can talk for a long time about this stuff, but if you don't act on behalf of your family, it's like you haven't even been here, okay? You need to take action. Once you take the action and you get the plan in place, it does not stop there. It cannot. Why? Because life changes and laws may change. And we need to continue to stay in touch to make sure that your plan stays current. Because if it's not current, frankly, it's worth the paper it's written on. Okay? So this is truly a process, and this is the reason why I suggest at the very beginning that you deal with somebody who specializes in this area so they can make sure they educate you on the latest and greatest trends and tools that you might want to take advantage of in order to be able to protect your family. Okay? That's all.